Let me nevertheless start the session now. So uh, now we are going really global in trade and in banking. And uh, in the spirit of the IMF, if I may say. Um, and we're going to have two papers, uh, one on the spillovers from geopolitical risk um, and uh, to domestic lending, and another one on trade fragmentation. Um, the first paper will be given by Frederica Niepmann of the Board of Governors and discussed by Giovanni della Riccia from the IMF. And the second paper, the one on trade fragmentation by Javier Quintana from Banco de España and discussed by my colleague Baptiste Meunier from the European Central Bank. You know the rules, 30 minutes paper, 10 minutes discussion. Here are signs, they get, the red gets darker the less time it comes. Close yours. All right. So thank you very much to the organizers for having me. Uh, I'm glad to present this paper. This is joint work with Leslie Shen, who's my colleague from the um, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And by before I say any further, let me read the disclaimer. Any opinions and conclusions expressed here are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, or anyone affiliated with the Federal Reserve System. So with this out of the way, I can <laughs> get started. Um, so unfortunately, geopolitical risk is on many people's minds uh, these days. And I've put here two um, quotes from Janet Yellen and Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, um, that basically say it, that this is at the forefront um, of developments and, and everybody on everybody's mind. So what, what is geopolitical risk? Um, Geopolitical risk is the threat, realization, and escalation of adverse events associated with tensions among states and political actors that affect the peaceful course of international relations. And why is geopolitical risk different from other types of risk? Um, it's unpredictable. It's international in scope. Um, one cannot do much about it. It's sudden. Um, developments can be very fast, as we've all seen. And the consequences can be disastrous. So. Um, you know, this is a, if this risk, it may be a tail risk, but if it materializes, it um, can cause really large losses. So geopolitical risk also affects banks that operate internationally. I've put here, um, you know, a news headline from Bloomberg um, the day before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And um, it, it says banks that stuck with Russia faced their biggest test of nerves. So um, as we have observed, geopolitical events can affect banks, um, especially through their operations in countries where geopolitical risk may rise. Um, the invasion of Ukraine led to uncertainty for banks operating in Russia, including um, some large European banks. And despite intention and pressure, banks have struggled to sell Russian subsidiaries. So in this paper, we want to understand whether banks propagate geopolitical risk that's mainly occurring abroad uh, to their home country. And so we ask, how um, do US banks adjust exposures to countries experiencing increasing geopolitical risk? That's the first, questions, uh, the first question. And then we want to know what are the implications for um, credit in the United States? Are there any spillover effects? I'm going to be brief on the data, but basically we combine different um, confidential regulatory data. Um, in particular, we have information on banks' foreign exposure. So we see, let's say, Citigroup's exposures in Mexico, Citigroup's exposure in Germany, and so on. Um, we draw on the, it's not really a credit registry, um, but the US has something that comes a little bit close to it. So we have um, also loan level data for the largest US banks. Um, we use that as well. Um, the drawback of these data are that um, they um, only exist or start um, in 2011, with some items only starting in 2014. So that would give us a very short uh, sample period. So we also look at the SLUS. This is the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, which is the equivalent to the Bank Lending Survey at the ECB. Um, where we observe, um, you know, banks reported changes to their um, lending standards. And these data go back to um, the 80s. So we can um, 
run our analysis on a for a much larger um, time period. And then we have some bank balance sheet data as well. So what are our main findings? I'm going to focus your attention on three facts um, that document um, you know, findings around uh, banks' foreign operations. So first, we find that an increase in geopolitical risk in a given country where a U.S. bank operates increases the credit risk of the bank that has the exposure. We would expect that that's the case. Um, if things get more risky, banks should recognize that risk. Second, um, U.S. banks reduce their operations abroad, um, but the extent to which they um, reduce their operations depends on the mode with which they operate there. So a U.S. bank can extend um, a loan, say, to a German borrower from its U.S. offices in the in the U.S., located in the U.S., or it could do it through either a branch or a subsidiary in Germany. And so this first mode we call a cross-border operation. The second mode we call um, a local operation. So when the operation is in the, you know, locally, uh, occurs locally in the host country where the um, U.S. bank operates. And so we find that banks reduce their cross-border exposure to a current country where geopolitical risk rises but we don't see a big response in the local operations. They seem to be stickier. Banks don't seem to divest from those operations that much. Um, and then there's always this question whether geopolitical risk is special or banks would respond in the same way to other types of risk. And I'll show you that we don't find the same response to other types of risk. So overall, um, we observe that banks are limited in their willingness or ability um, to de-risk their foreign operations when geopolitical risk abroad rises. That's at least true for their local operations. And, um, you know, this is sort of the first part of the empirical analysis. And then we move to understanding spillover effects um, in the United States. We find that in response to higher geopolitical risk, um, and we'll construct a measure of bank-specific geopolitical risk, which I'll come to in a minute, um, so, in response to higher bank-specific geopolitical risk, U.S. banks reduce their lending to um, U.S. firms, and they tighten their lending standards. And these, as we will show, um, effects stem mostly from countries where the banks have local operations. So, this means that we think that this transmission mechanism um, works through the stickiness um, of local operations, at least to some degree. So all in all, internationally active banks play a role in propagating geopolitical risk to countries that are removed from the conflict here, from the host countries where the risk occurs to um, the home country, the United States. I'll skip the literature. Obviously, this paper is related to other papers that study the transmission of shocks internationally through um, global banks. There are only a few papers that look at the response of banks to geopolitical risk. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. So how do we measure geopolitical risk and construct a measure of bank-specific geopolitical risk? I'll go there next. But before that, I want to show you um, why we think there can be spillover effects. So here, there's a little background on a little bit of background on U.S. Bank's foreign operations. So the left panel shows you the um, share of foreign exposures and total assets. So how international is a measure of how international U.S. banks are. So around 22 percent of U.S. banks' assets are foreign assets. And then to the right, um, I'm, I'm showing you how much of these operations happen in local um, branches or subsidiaries. And that's around 45, around 45 percent. Okay, and then of course we know that you know the most uh, internationally active banks are the largest banks. So to summarize, right, we have large U.S. banks that are very international, and that's why we think um, there can be spillover effects to the United States from geopolitical risk, risk that's occurring abroad. So now moving on to our bank-specific geopolitical risk index. Um, so we have measures of country-specific geopolitical risk. I'll talk about this in the next two slides. Um, we take those measures and then we weight these, um, this country-specific geopolitical risk with the exposures 
of banks in a given market. So we, as I said, we have the exposures of, say, Citigroup to Germany. So we'll weight the kind of geopolitical risk in Germany with um, the, um, you know, share of exposures of Citigroup that are in Germany, and then we sum um, sum this product over all countries. We have around um, 40 countries um, in, in the sample for which we have the geopolitical risk index. We can divide, so the weight, we have uh, choices um, over how we construct the weight exactly. Um, generally, our results are robust to how to different specifications. We will divide exposures either by total foreign exposures or by total assets. Um, the interpretation changes a little bit, but the results um, basically stay the same. Um, when you run, when you just take this bank-specific geopolitical risk index and you um, run a regression, just including time-fixed effects, you find that 34% of the variation in this bank-specific geopolitical risk index is explained by a common time factor, but that means we, we have um, some significant heterogeneity across banks in that measure that we construct, and that comes from uh, the fact that um, countries, uh, sorry, banks, um, do not all operate to the same extent in the same country. So, so we have um, some differences in the geography of, of banks' foreign operations. OK, so we have um, currently two measures of a geopolitical risk that we use. I'm showing you here um, probably the most popular and most well-known measure that was actually constructed my, by my colleagues, uh, Dario Caldara and Matteo Iacoviello. Um, that they constructed a geopolitical risk um, index based on newspaper articles, so um, using text-based method. So they basically search newspapers, articles um, for specific words associated with geopolitical risk. And you can see their um, global series here. Uh, it spikes, as you would expect, around September 11. You can see what happens around the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Also, um, we have the hum you know, Hamas attack in October um, um, as well. So October last year as well. Now, in addition to this, you know, well-documented measure, we construct our own geopolitical risk measure, um, relying on a tool that Tarek Hassan has, um, um, you know, is making available. Um, so basically, we use very similar words to search firms' earnings call transcripts. So instead of going to newspapers, as my colleagues did, we go to firms' earnings calls uh, transcripts and, and, and construct this measure. And the, um, the advantage is that we can look at, you know, we can base this measure just on all firms um, that report earnings, but we can also restrict um, the um, earnings calls to firms um, to financial to those um, um, you know conducted by financial firms, and then we um, can actually construct a measure of um, you know geopolitical risk that comes from actual acts um, versus just the threat. Um, this is something we are still exploring, so I will not have that many results about this. But that's the direction we're going. Okay. Um, there's always this question, how is geopolitical risk different from other risk measures that the literature suggests? And this is really just to show that these um, two geopolitical risk measures that we're using are distinct from other measures of risk. So we're comparing here to country risk um, constructed by Tarek Hassan, you know, based on earnings um, our transcripts. And we also have plot here the um, World Uncertainty Index, which is on the um, bottom right, and then you have the country risk index on the top right, and our two measures on the left. And you know what you can see here is that the geopolitical risk measures really spike at different um, times, right? So when you look to the right, you see the COVID crisis um, clearly <laughs> um, indicated by the series, and also the global financial crisis. But if you compare that to uh, the measures of geopolitical risk, you don't see uh, much movement in the indicators there. So this is a, this, you know, just say that this is um, capturing specific, as a more specific type of risk. Okay, so now moving to the facts. Um, as I was saying, our first fact is that 
the credit risk in banks' portfolios actually increases when geopolitical risk rises. So we have this loan level data where we observe the probability of default that um, banks assign to a specific loan and we know the location of the borrower. So we aggregate this to um, these data to get a um, you know, weighted average probability of default of a country level portfolio. So let's say, sticking with my example, uh, Citigroup's uh, portfolio of CNI loans in Germany, Citigroup's um, portfolio of CNI loans in France, and so on, right? So we have the prob weighted, prob weighted average probability of default. And you know, we want to know, does that respond to our as to the country-specific geopolitical risk um, index? So here, we're not using the bank-specific yet, OK? So you would expect that as the risk in a country rises, the probability of default should respond. And that's what we find. Um, and that's shown by the significant and positive coefficients in this table. I think um, generally we split our results often in um, in a sample where we take the most more internationally active banks and the less internationally active banks. And generally our results are much stronger for the more internationally active banks, um, which you see here in column two. So on the right, I'm plotting um, a chart from an event study we did. So we look here at basically uh, the response of the probability of default of loans to Russian borrowers in, res in, um, in response to, sorry, in response to um, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And so here you can see this clear jump in the probability of default, um, which is roughly um, um, equivalent to 1.5 um, times the standard deviation of the average probability of default. So I think that is probably something that makes sense. Um, in terms of the magnitude. Okay, so then we also want to show whether this um, increase in risk in a bank's portfolio is large enough to actually also explain the uh, variation in the average probability of default of the bank's entire CNI loan portfolio. So now we aggregate to the entire um, you know portfolio level. So this would be the weighted average probability of default of Citi's group entire CNI loan portfolio. And you can see that, uh, in fact, the and here we now use the bank specific geopolitical risk index that I showed you uh, earlier. And so we find that, um, you know, even in the aggregate, um, geopolitical risk can um, explain pro uh, the probability of default. Okay, so moving on. To the second fact, so then we want to know how do banks respond um, in their foreign operations when geopolitical risk rises in a country. Um, so we look at the total exposures, total assets, if you want, total the, the correct term is total claims. Um, say in, again, so cities group um, claims in Germany responding to a rise in geopolitical risk in Germany, right? So as you would expect, as geopolitical risk rises, exposures fall. But the interesting piece is, um, sorry, is here. Um, so we run regression separately on exposures that are um, cross-border exposures. So again, that occur because a bank lands from the home country to a foreign borrower versus exposures that are local, that are loans extended from uh, the foreign offices of the bank. It could be a branch, it could be a subsidiary. And so interestingly, we find that this, um, that geopolitical risk um, makes banks contract cross-border lending, but local lending actually doesn't, um, doesn't respond. Um, and just to give you a sort of some magnitudes, so the Russian war-induced increase in Geopolitical risk um, for Russia reduces cross-border claims to fall by 40%. Um, and we'll see in the next chart that that jives with the aggregate data. Okay, so response in cross-border lending, not so much in local um, local lending. And here's a chart, you know, that helps you um, see this result visually. So uh, on the left, we have exposures of um, U.S. banks to Russia. Um, and on the right, we have um, the exposures to Russia of all banks that report the BIS banking statistics, right? And what you can see clearly, so in, in blue, you have cross-border exposures. In red, you have local exposures. And you can see that the cross-border exposures respond a lot more to um, various um, geopolitical events um, that involve Russia um, than, um, 
than local claims, consistent with what I just showed you. Okay, so fact three is that um, geopolitical risk seems to be a distinct source of risk and banks do not respond in the same way to other types of risk. Um, I already introduced these other measures. So CRI is the country risk index from Tarek Hassan, WUI is the world uncertainty index, and then we also um, use here the credit default swap, uh, the sovereign credit default swap um, spread. And as you can see, there isn't uh, too much of a response, um, especially there isn't this um, clear, um, you know, uh, distinct response of cross-border claims versus local claims to the same type of risk. Now, I wanted to talk uh, for a second a bit about anecdotal evidence. So why is it that local claims don't respond as much as cross-border claims? And what I'm showing you here, uh, and this, doesn't, this table doesn't just include US banks, is sort of the evolution of exposures to Russia um, before and then after um, the invasion um, of Ukraine. And you can see that generally, um, you know, at least up to 2023 Q2 um, in the third column, right? Um, exposures didn't drop that much. We have Societe Generale that sold a subsidiary at a loss of $3.3 billion very early on um, to a Russian oligarch before it became illegal to do so. So um, this is just another illustration that, um, you know, to some extent, uh, banks um, face difficulties divesting. It may be hard to find an investor, and then uh, it may could be very costly. Um, so banks may be overall unwilling um, to some extent to divest. I think we're seeing that um, very clearly. Um, yeah. So just some evidence that supports that local claims um, may be, or some some reasons why local claims may be sticky. Okay, so moving to the second part of the empirical results. Now we study the spillover effects. So we want to know um, when geopolitical risk rises abroad, does that have an effect on credit in the United States? Well, here is a little bit of conceptual background. So why do we think there can be the spillover effects? Well, we know banks have to adhere to a capital constraint, right? So um, equity, um, or CET1 capital um, typically over risk weighted assets needs to be bigger than some uh, number, right? So there's a regulatory constraint and then banks mu here. And then typically banks hold a buffer that they keep pretty constant over this um, requirement. So I've included this here. So what happens when foreign risk rises, right? Um, it basically means that, um, you know, if you can't do something about risk rising, you have to reduce lending. Now, if you don't reduce foreign lending a lot, um, and if foreign lending is large, right, then um, the reduction of domestic lending must be larger. Okay, so this is this is the mechanism we have in mind. So as I was saying, we have different sets of data that have different advantages and disadvantages. We start, I start by showing you results with our loan level data. So here we have for US banks, the newly originated loans um, every quarter at the firm, at the firm level, okay? Um, and we regress loan originations on our bank-specific geopolitical risk index. And because this data is at the loan level, we can actually control for firm time fixed effects, um, gamma, y IT, uh, gamma IT here, um, you know, which is the standard way of controlling for changes in the demand from firms for credit. Again, the sample period is relatively short. Um, here, the data start in 2014 but we'll remedy this with the other data set. Okay, so here are some of our results. Um, so focus on column one. So as bank-specific geopolitical risk goes up, loan originations go down. Um, a one standard um, deviation increase in BGPR reduces loan originations by 9%. And as I was saying, we find um, more significant results um, for the more internationally 
active banks. Um, yeah, the coefficient, I don't know, the coefficient in column five looks a little strange to me. Um, um, sorry about that, I need to double check that. But um, in general, the results are stronger and um, more significant for the more internationally active banks. We also find, I'm not showing this, that the results are stronger for banks with lower capital, which um, provides some support for the mechanism um, that we have in mind. So here are the results with our earnings core base measure. I should have said this. So this was with the um, base, this BGPR um, index is based on the Caldara Yakoviello measure. This, these are the results with our um, own measure. The results are generally very similar. We can, um, you know, distinguish here between acts and threats, and it does seem like results are more driven by um, threats, not acts. So this would mean that banks are mainly responding to the risk of geopolitical, of a geopolitical event, and that we're not just capturing sort of actual events where a war broke out um, or there was um, some kind of actual. Um, military conflict, et cetera. And results generally um, look relatively similar when we condition on earnings transcripts uh, from financial firms only. OK, so um, you know, I emphasized a lot sort of the stickiness of these local exposures. So we also wanted to study whether uh, spillovers are larger when banks have local operations. So when banks have local operations, they also have cross-border operations. So um, in columns, so basically um, we distinguish between observations where there are local and cross-border exposures and cross-border exposures only. Okay. And so what we do here is basically we <laughs> decompose our bank-specific geopolitical risk index. Remember how we do this. We have the country-specific index. We put weights and we sum, right? And we basically sum separately for observations where banks have local exposures and cross-border exposures and um, observations where banks have only cross-border exposures. Okay. And then so the sum of those two gives our <laughs> BGPR index. Um, and what you can see here is that our results are driven by country bank observations where the bank has um, local exposures. And as we include both of our measures, um, the sort of measure that comes from these low, um, observations with local exposures is the significant one. So we, we think this is evidence that the um, spillovers come more from uh, banks that have branches or subsidiaries abroad. Okay, so um, just briefly um, on the results that use the US bank lending survey. So here we have information on bank level responses to the SLUs. So banks can say whether they kept lending standards unchanged, whether they tightened or whether they loosened. And so we regress that uh, actually now on the change in um, bank specific geopolitical risk. Um, and as I said here, now we have data from 1990 onwards. So I'm going to, um, you know, speed up a little bit, but just saying that we confirm our results. So as bank specific geopolitical risk rises, banks are more likely to report that they um, tighten credit standards. And the effect of um, geopolitical risk here is about 90% that of changes in the VIX. And we know VIX is one measure that's driving um, tightening and loosening in credit standards. Okay, let me skip this. Um, so one concern um, that you might have with our identification strategy is that um, U.S. banks could be lending to U.S. firms that export to countries where geopolitical risk arises, right? And then the firms may actually have a lower demand for credit. And so this result, these results could be um, driven by demand and not supply. That said, we control for firm time fixed effects, but, you know, there are papers that have said that may not be enough. So. When we have data, so given that we have data on, um, you know, credit standards, we can look at the standards on commercial real estate loans, okay? So, and these are certainly, the firms that get these loans are certainly those that are not very international, right? So we wouldn't uh, think that they are, um, these firms' demand for loans is affected a lot, and we also find, confirm our results here. So also, uh, not just um, 
standards on CNI loans respond to geopolitical risk, but also CRE loans. Okay, we have a bunch of additional results and robustness. I'm sure my <laughs> discussion will, uh, will um, get me to talk a little bit about those <laughs> later. Um, so let me conclude. Um, I've shown you three facts about geopolitical risk and global banking. First, as one would expect, when geopolitical risk rises in a country, the credit risk of the exposures associated, that, uh, associated with um, that country increase. Banks reduce cross-border lending, but not so much local lending when geopolitical risk rises. And um, geopolitical risk seems to be distinct from other sources of risk. And we do find these spillover effects for um, both for loan originations to U.S. firms and for um, credit standards, both in CNI lending and CRE lending, um, with local exposures driving our results. We have some ongoing work. Um, there's still more much, much more to do. Uh, we're examining, examining the longer-term effects and some non-linear effects. Um, so hopefully at another time I can talk about that. So thank you very much. Thank you for a point lending in time. And uh, Giovanni, your, the floor is yours. I thank you for um, having me here to discuss this paper. Um, the same disclaimer with change in the institution applies to my discussion as to the paper. Um, so, summary, I, I think Frederike did a fantastic job in presenting the paper, but just to give you a sense, I, I think, uh, and we were discussing this with Philip before, uh, if you remember the Pick and Rosengren paper from 2000, looking at the effects of uh, the Japanese banking crisis on lending, in the United States, this is sort of flipping in on its head. So rather than looking at the crisis at the um, holding companies, at the parent banks, is is looking at problems in the host countries and looking at how problems in the host countries is affecting the lending by the parent banks in the United States. Uh, but the, the concept is, is similar from the point of view. So the idea is here is to look at how changes uh, in geopolitical risk affect the lending by U.S. banks. In particular, I think the most interesting part is lending at home by U.S. banks rather than lending in the host countries. And it shows that you, you get very significant effects through their, their, their exposure to these foreign assets. And in particular, it matters how that exposure is structured, whether it's direct cross-border lending by, say, city in New York, to a company in Russia or Ukraine or in a country exposed to geopolitical risk versus having city in Kiev with branches and subsidiaries collecting funds there and lending funds there. And the effect is larger in the second case than in the first. And the authors ascribe this difference to the fact of how easy it is to divest from the country is different depending on the form of incorporation. Uh, so let me give you a general reaction. I think it's a very well-written paper. It's beautifully executed. I highly recommend it to anybody that is interested in these topics. I think it's a not particularly investigated topic. I mean, as I, as I said, I had to go back to Pick and Rosengren, so it's talking 20 years. And uh, they, the data sets that they have access to are fantastic, are regulatory confidential data which not all of us uh, can uh, can use. And the evidence is very convincing. I mean, Frederica didn't go through the various um, robustness tests. And also, I think there are more in, in her presentation that they were in the papers that was delivered to me. But <laughs> the, um, they, I, I'm convinced that the results are there. So I, I'm going to discuss a couple of things that I think are missed opportunity in the papers for, for further work. One, I think that they could discuss and examine a little bit more what are the channels of transmission and, and how they really operate. And the second part is what are the policy implications of this finding that the paper is, is at the moment pretty silent about it. Um, so in terms of the channel of transmission, you can think about macro and you know these macro effects are mostly taken care by the 
a econometric specification that they do, which is diff and diff, and they look at the effect on different banks, so the macro effects are taken care of. But the obvious thing is, if I see a war in Ukraine and I'm in the United States, I may be concerned about demand in the United States itself. So it's good that they do diff and diff because this, this is taken care of. I think the direct impact on, on firms trading with the country in question is also control through their extension when they look at um, real estate loans that are probably less affected by these problems. So the bank level, and this goes to the crux of the paper, you, you can have exposure through cross-border lending or, or through foreign affiliate. And I think this is where there needs to be a little bit more of discussion. This is, you know, shameless self-promotion. We At the fund, we did some research on the difference between branches and, and subsidiaries when banks go abroad, and this is now 15 years old research, both from a theoretical perspective and from an empirical one. And, uh, you know, if you think about a subsidiary, at least legally, a subsidiary is a separate bank. It has its own capitalization. And so from the point of view of city US, whether the risk a city Ukraine goes up or not is secondary. In the sense is not necessarily, this depends on, on the, the way US supervisors and regulators may force city US to recognize that their subsidiary has become riskier. A branch is a different animal. A branch will have a balance sheet that is completely uh, consolidated on the parent. And so from that point of view, the effects should be much larger uh, for branches and subsidiaries. And this is something that the authors could investigate. So rather than just separating the exposure through cross-border lending from local lending, I would also separate the two forms of incorporation for the local affiliates. And by the way, this also tends to explain a little bit why banks do not react in cutting credit as fast when they are local affiliates is because local affiliates will be funded with local funds. And so from the point of view of geopolitical risk, think about being exposed to sanctions or expropriation by a you know, style government is very different if there are US deposits at risk or there are deposits in the host country that are used to fund credit in that country. Uh, so the, the second thing that I noticed from the paper, this, this actually was something very interesting and the paper doesn't, doesn't discuss too much, is the changes over time in the in the form of uh, foreign exposure and, and you see in the chart that Frederike presented is that you had a spike in direct lending between 2000 and the global financial crisis and then that went down and and so I think it'd be interesting to look at whether for example post GFC reforms had changed a cost benefit analysis for banks on how they lend abroad so do you want to be a, a subsidiary, a, a branch, or, or direct lending? And, and this, this is something that they could do as well. So um, finally, I, I think this is a, a very interesting question, whether it is geopolitical risk from the point of view of its effects on economics, or is geopolitical risk because of the concern that the bank managers have about sanctions. So it's two different things. And, and I think you have almost the perfect natural experiment. So you, you did the experiment with the Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine. You could look at the Israel-Gaza episode. But from an economic point of view, you have an equally worrisome situation, maybe more, but there is certainly no concern about the US putting sanctions on Israel. Uh, while there was plenty of reasonable concern that that would happen in Russia. And so they, this could be, you know, really your, your smoking gun in terms of what is the concern is geopolitical risk or the, or the economic risk associated with geopolitical developments. And finally, I, I think, and this goes back to my point about branches and subsidiaries, it, it really matters what kind of resolution plans supervisor and regulators impose on the banks and uh, whether they are what is called single point of entry or multiple point of entry your effects are consistent with single point of entry in the sense that they will look at the holding company and treat it as one entity 
uh, in the case in which you you split the bank in many in many parts, it would be less uh, less obvious that you should have the effects that you find. I have one minute. Do I? I had like oh, fantastic. I had three points on the on the specification. Then we we can talk much more bilaterally. Uh, one is that. I, I was surprised that well, there were no time fixed effect in the lending standard regression. In the paper, it says it's too uh, demanding, but I didn't understand what that meant. So I, maybe you can talk about that. Um, in the two different types of weights that you use, I would focus more on the one uh, on country exposure relative to total assets. The other one, I didn't really understand why it would work. It works. So I think that there is an interesting question there on why that index works. And uh, maybe you can put both together in one way or another in regression, see what happens. There, there is a weird finding on the country level geopolitical risk uh, in the sense that when they look at the change in the riskiness of the portfolio at the country level for banks that are not very internationally active, the coefficient is not significant. And I was trying to figure out why this matters, given is that the country level, they should be all the same. And that points a little bit to the fact that maybe the internationally active banks and the non-internationally active banks are very different animals. And they land in a di different way to different companies. And um, uh, that's it. I already discussed the rest. Thank you. Have your half hour. <coughs> Javier, please. <coughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you, the, the organizers, for, for having me here presenting this, uh, this work in which I think what are the potential consequences of a, of a shock uh, halting the, the trade linkages between large uh, geopolitical, uh, geopolitical blocks, and in particular, what are the, uh, how these consequences could look like on different, uh, on different uh, time, uh, time horizons. First of all, let me the usual disclaimer that my bosses are not willing to take any responsibility on whatever I say here. So just, uh, just a, as an introduction, even if I think it's not uh, completely necessary on this, on this meeting, uh, uh, geopolitical tensions have emerged as uh, one of the main threats to the economic, uh, to the economic uh, outlook uh, um, economic outlook recently, and this has raised a lot of attention on trying to understand uh, better what are, the, what are the consequences of, a, of a, whether a partial or total reverse of the, of the global trade integration process that took, uh, took place over, the, over, recent, uh, over recent decades, whether there are hidden costs or, 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 or unseen costs of uh, having a large dependent on particular countries, and whether it is convenient or not to try to run some, some or to undergo some, some sort of a reshoring or free insuring, free insuring uh, process, trying to, to bring uh, to reduce part of this, part of this, uh, part of this dependent. Indeed, I have to say that <clears throat> as a part of this interest, this paper was born as a contribution to a task force uh, set by the by the ECB on the on the topic. So <clears throat> these, <clears throat> these risks are not, uh, are not only part of an hypothetical future. Indeed, actually, all the, the, the trade embargo on Russia following the, the aggression on, on Ukraine has, uh, has been a, a leading actor on the European economic stage over the, over the period uh, of the post-pandemic post period. And it is neither only something from the, from the past. Indeed, the, the potential threat or the possibility of a larger decoupling, especially between China and the, and, the, uh, and, the Western, and the Western countries, particularly given the larger size on the, on the global economy or the larger share of the global economy accounted by, by China, could have uh, even uh, grimmer, grimmer consequences. So where are the features that I will be trying to trying to look at, and especially when, when looking at what are the consequences to be to be expected. The first thing is about the is about the, the propagation. Even if uh, only a small share of the European or, or Western firms are maybe directly exposed to China, maybe they are they are there are only a few direct importers from uh, from China. We know that for sure there will be a strong propagation a strong propagation effect. The second key element it's about it's about timing. The effects are probably not going to be the same whether we are thinking on a on a very short run than if we think on a on a longer period. And the reason is that you know the longer the time you have to 
to adapt the, the, the less severe will be the, will be the consequences. You will, be, you will have a, a larger time to, to adapt, so part of the short-run pain will be alleviated over, the, over, a, over, a, over, a short, over a longer, over a longer run. And in particular, something that I will be looking at uh, today, it's about what are the consequences whether this uh, trade halt happens on, on, different types of, on different types of good. Related to the, to the point before about the time horizon, it's probably going to be different whether we are thinking of intermediate goods, of intermediate inputs like that are non-durable, that if we are looking at, at capital goods, which are by, by nature, they, they are durable. So, of course, the, there will be an interaction with the with the previous with the previous point, if uh, if you cannot import a capital good for a couple of a couple of years, well, it might not be as severe than if you have to stop the consumption of an input that you have to buy uh, period by period. Just to uh, to to summarize the, the idea of, of the of the paper, maybe we can we can think of the uh, of the case that whether the Chinese, whether for, for, for Europe, for example, whether the Chinese solar panels, we should think that they are the same as the, as the Russian gas. Europe had or has or used to have a large dependence on Russian natural gas on the, on the supply, on the supply of, of energy. And, and similarly, also the supply of solar panels that are produced, manufactured in, in China, and they are imported to, to Europe. They are also very important for the, for the production of electricity in Europe. However, maybe the consequences of a halt in imports of the two different goods could be, could be different. We have learned over the last uh, two, and a half, uh, two and a half years that the Russian gas is something that you have to basically buy at the time that you consume. So every year you have to, to import the same amount of, uh, of natural gas that you, have to, that, that, you are, that you want to consume. So if you need to, to substitute it, it, it has been proven to be very difficult to find new suppliers, to find new ways of, of substitute this uh, energy, energy, energy source. So probably the, 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 the losses have been, have been much more severe. On the other hand, even if solar panels that are manufactured in, in China are very important for the electricity generation in, the generation in Europe, if tomorrow the European Union imposes a, a, a trade embargo or a very large tariff on the imports of this of this particular good, the production of, of solar energy is not going to change at all in Europe immediately because you know this is these are capital goods that are already installed that they are going to be producing. Of course, this is going to affect the growth rate. It might affect the, the replacement ratio, but the effects are going to be very different. The, and, and in particular, because there are going to be a larger period to, to adapt. It might be that you depress the investment on, on solar panels for a few years, but maybe in those years, you have the uh, necessary time, enough time to find new suppliers and to maybe produce them domestically or produce it also in a third country, but in a, in a, friendly, in a, friendly, in a friendly country. So to, uh, to, look at, uh, to look at these uh, consequences, I'm going to be working, I'm going to have a, a network approach and in particular a, a dynamic uh, network approach that the part of network is important to take into account the multiplier effect. So basically the transmission about, about the, 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 production, the, the production chain, the global value chain, and also the, the potential trade rerouting. So basically the, the ability to, to substitute one particular suppliers that are now on the opposite block by other, by other, by other suppliers. Now, where are the dynamics in the, but on top of being a, a network model, this is going to be also a, a dynamic model. And, and the dynamics are going to be coming from, from, different, from different sources. The first one related to what I said before, that there is a large evidence on the, on the literature that trade elasticities are probably increasing, are, are increasing over time. So the, the, the longer you have, the, the, the longer the time you have to adapt, it's going to be more, it's going to be easier to substitute new suppliers. And this, of course, will help to alleviate, to alleviate the, the cost of, of, mis, uh, of misallocation. There are uh, several, uh, I mean, there are quite a, quite a few papers uh, looking, looking, looking at those. The second part or the, or the second source of, of dynamics is that I'm going to be able to, uh, to use or to look at not only at the network or the supply network of intermediate inputs, but on top of that to look at the, at the network of investment goods. So I'm going to be able to trace how the price of investment, the, the price of the, of the capital to be installed on a particular sector in a particular country might change following a, a, trade, uh, a trade disruptions. So 
and this is and this is going to be important again because you know as long as we don't assume a perfect or a fully depreciation period by period, but if instead we have a more realistic depreciation, depreciation rate, in this case, part of the trade disruption will affect investment goods, but the negative effects of a lower capital stock will, will pile up with, uh, with over time, but it will not be a, an upfront, uh, an upfront uh, cost. Also, in terms of uh, trade flows, there is going to be, as I said before, there is going to be the, the room to have uh, some intertemporal substitution. Maybe if in the very short run, uh, changing one capital goods supplier by another is very costly, well, the firms will try to wait maybe for a couple or three years in which the trade elasticity is, is higher, so it is easier to find a new, a new supplier. So the, the cost will again be, will be, will, uh, again be lower on the, on, the longer, on the longer time. Also, the, the, there are going to be some uh, anticipation or the, or the potential to some anticipation effects. I will be showing you the cases in which the, the trade eruption uh, happens uh, suddenly or it, or it is uh, anticipated by the, by, the, by the agents. In the case of anticipation, it might be that actually it gives you time to stockpile in uh, part of the investment goods that now you are invest that you are insourcing from the, uh, from, 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 from the opposite uh, block, let's say, prior to the trade fragmentation. So this is something that helps to, to alleviate, uh, the, to helps to, to alleviate the, the, the cost of, of trade fragmentation. And, and on top of that, in, in the model, there will be also the standard, uh, for example, the, the, the smoothing of, of consumption, but these are maybe less particular to the, less particular to the, to the model. Now, what are the implications for, for this? Well, this is going to have uh, implications both on the time profile. I will show you that taking into account this, uh, this, this uh, dynamics probably tells you that the costs are not going to be as severe as in the case in which uh, you don't take into account this these uh, these features but in the long term it might be it might actually be be larger so if you take into account the 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 path of adjustment of capital in the short run you might have uh, not so big effects but in the long run as long as the the, the price of investment goods is going to go up so the investment rate will will go down this will have a taking into account this this channel will have an additional uh, an additional effect on the on the an, an additional negative effect So, uh, so as I said, I'm going to be using a, a dynamic multi-sector, multi-country model in which there are going to be networks, both for the intermediate inputs, but as a, as a novelty, let's say, there, it will be also for the, for the investment goods network. So similarly to the case of the standard input-output uh, network, in which I know which particular sector and country is the supplier to a particular, to any other supplier country, I'm going to be able to do the same also in the case of, uh, of, of investment goods. Uh, for the scenario today, I mean, the, I, I will be focused on the on the severe scenario, the, the so what, I, what we call in the report the, the Cold War scenario, in which basically the the, the trade between opposite blocks uh, uh, disappear. So just to give a, a hint on the on the on the model, let me focus on the on the production side, which is where the most of the action uh, takes uh, takes part because uh, the, there will be some reaction from from household but the but the most important uh, part of the of the reaction will go through the through the production through the production side the the firms are will be using capital and labor they will also use uh, energy and they will in addition to that they will use uh, intermediate inputs uh, both here, both uh, all these intermediate inputs are goods and services that are going to be sourced from other uh, sectors on the on the economy. But it's not. But the firms are not only going to uh, have different goods and and services. But on top of that, for each type of good and for each uh, type of uh, for each type of uh, service, the firms will also source. Sorry. The, the firms will also combine the different local variety of each sector. So basically the, the most or the, the relevant uh, part of adjustment today will happen in this, in this part of the production tree. So basically in which here within all the national or the national varieties of a particular good, ones are going to get much more, uh, uh, much more expensive than other because of the, the, the imposition of, a, of, a, of an additional trade cost. Of course, ones that 
a particular good becomes, a, becomes more expensive because the supplier from which you used to purchase it, it's, a, it's now a subject to, to, a, uh, to a tax. This may also have the, uh, a propagation effect on the, on, the rest of the, on the rest of the production side. Now, the, 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 the difference here is that the, the same uh, story that I just told you about intermediate inputs, it's going to happen for investment goods. So the capital bundle of a particular sector, it's going to be composed by different goods and, and services that are going to uh, be in supply by the, rest of the, by the rest of the sectors. And on top of that, those particular goods, for each of those particular goods, they are going to combine the suppliers for, from, different, from different countries. So the important part here is that, is that we are, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, construct this particular matrix omega that, first of all, is telling me how important is a particular sector for the capital bundle of a particular industry. And on top of that, I'm going to be able to tell from which particular country a given industry is buying the, the imports, is buying the, the investment, is buying the investment goods. Why is this uh, relevant for the, why is it uh, relevant for the, uh, for the, um, for the model world? Because as, as long as now I'm going to be able to trace or to, to relate a cost shock in a particular industry to the price of the investment bundle of any other, of any other industry, the, existence of a particular iceberg cost, so the, the addition of uh, any uh, trade cost, what it will happen is it will allow me to tell us, okay, now the, the price of investment of, uh, of this industry is going to go up, so in the, in the, in the new equilibrium, the, the, the investment will have, to be, will have to be lower to compensate up to the point in which you compensate the, 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 additional, the additional cost. Okay, so this is the, well, this is the, Let's say the, the, the most relevant part of the, on the on the on the production side. Of course, this this increase in the cost because of the trade disruption is also going to happen on the on the on the on the part of the intermediate inputs. But this is let's say the, the standard the standard uh, network model. So uh, the the previous part was important to look at the consequences in terms of uh, in terms of uh, production. The model could also be used to try to tell something about about prices and about and about inflation. Of course, this uh, this uh, type of models they 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 give uh, relative uh, prices, but this also giving us is giving a, a hint of what could happen on not only relative but absolute but absolute prices. You have to think that a that a trade fragmentation cost is first of all going to be inflationary and on top of that it's going to increase the relative prices of both uh, capital intermediate inputs and energy with respect to with respect to labor so if at the same time you put a, an inflationary process and a, and a relative loss on, on real and a relative loss on, on real wages probably this might get uh, room to to large uh, to, to large uh, second round effects, so basically that the that the wages, the nominal wages, will try to to update in the in the future, creating a persistence of the of the of the nominal shock. So uh, for the data and, and, and calibration, I'm I'm gonna talk about the main sources that I'm that I'm using. First of all, for the production uh, parameters and the trade information, I rely on the on the inter-country input-output uh, network that is supplied by the, by the OECD. This has information about the trade flows between uh, 44 sectors and almost 70, 70 countries. And this, uh, this is allowing me to, to, let's say, to calibrate the standard, the standard parameter. So I will know how important is uh, labor and capital for a particular good, how important is a particular intermediate input, and within each of the intermediate inputs, how important is a country in the supply of that particular, of that particular input. Now, for the exercise uh, today, there is a, an issue with this, uh, with this data. I'm using the year 2019 uh, version or the, the data from the, from the year 2019. Of course, uh, if we want to think of what might be the consequences of additional trade fragmentation, so basically what are the consequences if Europe or the, or the Western economies and, and China are going to be, uh, and, the, and the Eastern are going to be decoupling, well, it, uh, it actually happens that 
part of this trade decoupling, especially in Europe, has already happened in the case of, of, of Russia. So basically, if we took this uh, data, which is the latest uh, available, uh, and we ran the, the exercise of trying to decouple both uh, Russia and China from the, from the rest of the world, the number that we will be getting is not the additional effect that we should expect, but instead it will be a kind of a double counting of the, of the effects. So to deal, with this, uh, to deal with these issues, the number that I will be showing you today, it's working with the same data, but with an adapted version. An adapted version, how do I do it? Is first of all, I simulate the trade decoupling between Russia and Western economies, and then it's giving me a new equilibrium, so because it's telling me how the trade flows are gonna react. So what I do is that I uh, use these changes that are predicted according to the model to create, let's say, new input-output uh, matrices. So the, the, the important thing that I will be showing you today is that even if I'm going to be assuming that both Russia and China are decoupling from the Western economies, you have to think that the effects in the case of Europe are or, on top of what we have already experienced over the, the last uh, two years. The second part, as I said before, I'm going to be using, let's say, the, the equivalent to the intermediate input to the intermediate input uh, network matrix. So on, before, I had a, an, an input that is the one that you can take off the shelf, in which is telling you that a particular sector is supplying a particular amount of money to any other sector in the in the world. But these are trade only in intermediate input. What I do is that I build an investment at the equivalent, but instead of intermediate, with investment good. So basically what I'm doing is a, an open economy version of the, of the paper by Von Lehm and Wimberry or, or Foster and, and co-authors in which basically I want to create the, the, this is a bit threatening because I have more than seven minutes. But, uh, Let's carry on, it's just in seven okay. minutes. Now, as I said, this is a this is a data that it's not available of the of the self, and that I actually have to construct to do this to do this uh, to do this exercise. Now, to do it and, and very briefly, I'm combining two data sources. The first one is again the the input output the intercountry input output uh, database. However, this database is only telling me, for example, that the German vehicle manufacturing is giving is selling a a certain amount of investment goods to Spain, but I'm not able to trace to which particular sectors these are going to be, these are going to be sold. So to overcome this uh, problem, so to trying to build or to move from this column information to a matrix information, what I use as well is the claims uh, database. And the claims database, what it's giving me information, it's for a particular sector, which type of investment assets is investing on. So basically, it's telling me that, for example, I can or I can use this information to say that the land transportation sector in Spain accounts for a given percentage of all the investment on a particular on a particular asset. So basically, combining these two sources, I can and, and of course, given uh, or, or creating a bridge file between as type of assets, which is the what are the information that I have here, and the sector that produces this particular type of assets. I can move from the, let's say, from a column to a square matrix, okay? So this is, again, telling me, okay, how dependent is a particular sector in Germany from the, uh, um, from the machinery, sector, machinery sector in China and whether it's going to be depending because it buys intermediate inputs or because it buys investment, it buys investment goods because it may have different effects on the, on the, after the trade fragmentation. Another important uh, element are the trade elasticities. As I, as I said before, it's, it's, there is a lot of evidence on the, on the literature that trade elasticities tends to grow over time. That they are relatively low in the short term. It's very difficult to change a supplier today, but it's much easier to change a supplier in, in four or five years. So uh, what, I, what I do uh, is that I take the sectoral, uh, the long-term sector-specific estimates in Fontanier and and, and co-authors, these are the long-term sector-specific uh, estimates, 
And what I do is that, okay, these are the long term, but I'm going to assume the uh, a value typically found on the, on the literature that the first year or the year one elasticities are 0 0.75. The, the, estimate, the estimates in Fontanien and Cothors are definitely much higher. And what I'm going to assume is that the trade elasticities are moving from 0 0.75 to the long-term values over a period of 10 years. Okay. Then for the for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the elasticities and, and parameters, I rely very much on the on the usual values on the. On the on the literature uh, taken from the Bakai Fari uh, paper or the Atalai paper. So the exercise that I'm going to be uh, or the or the results that are going to be showing are the ones of the following exercises that I mean I'm modeling trade disruption as an increasing as a, as increasing the cost of trade among different geopolitical blocks. I will tell you which uh, countries are in in each of in each of them. Something that is important is that these uh, trade costs are going to be iceberg cost. So basically, that the governments are not going to be receiving or not, are not going to be collecting any 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 revenue, and that these iceberg costs apply whether we are dealing with intermediate in investment or consumption or consumption goods. Uh, for this, uh, for for today, the the, the value that I'm going to be using is a hundred and fifty uh, increase in the in the cost across uh, across uh, blocks. Which in the in the long term basically gives or puts the the trade flows back to the to the Cold War era levels. So just uh, briefly, the the country uh, block uh, classification. So basically, I'm going to assume that the east is uh, China and Hong Kong and, and Russia. In the west, uh, the the European Union, other countries on the on the, the G7. Okay, but the, again, you can. You can refine maybe the, some some cases, but as long as as you have uh, China on the on the one side and you have the European Union and the United States on the other, the, the results are going to be roughly similar. Okay, so these are the consequences, or in terms of uh, uh, GNE, so the the on, on real uh, gross national expenditure for each of the three blocks. And this is the case in which this Cold War scenario, so this 150 tariff, it's imposed in a, in a sudden way. Okay, it's, it's imposed uh, suddenly. For the West, what you can see is that the long-term uh, effects are a bit uh, more than one and a half percentage, uh, one and a half percentage points, which is the, the red line that, that you can see that you can see here. The long-term effects for the Eastern Bloc is our much higher, but you can think that if you that it, that, it, that the, the the relative size of each of the blocks. So basically, the eastern block is much smaller than the western one. So they are being cut off to the access to a larger part of, of world of world GDP. So this is why the, the effects are are much uh, are much stronger. And for the neutral countries, they have and they have some positive effect, but it's uh, relatively relatively small because even if they are gaining share on the world on the world GDP on the world economy at the same time the world economy is shrinking so basically they are not getting lost they are not getting worse but they are uh, but they are not getting much better okay so uh, here what I have is I, I split the western the western block so if you are interested on the on the case the if we look at the effect on the European Union or the or the US, the effects are actually smaller because within the West, the ones that are getting the, the higher exposure are the other countries in the West. Uh, just think that I have in that block, I have Japan, I have Korea and so on, that they have a larger trade flows with uh, larger trade flows with uh, with China. But but overall, the, the key message from, from here is that the short term losses can be I have been talking about the long term or the new equilibrium, but the short term losses might be much more severe than the than the long run than the long run one. So something that it's uh, uh, natural to uh, to think it's okay. What it's gonna okay. So now let me before I talk about the, any any other thing, just let me talk about okay where are these losses on on national income coming from, and what you are seeing here are the effects on the GNE on the Western Bloc. But what I'm doing is that I'm splitting on, on three components. The one uh, in, in yellow is the labor contribution. 
The one in red is the capital contribution, and the blue, what I call trade losses, are basically the terms of trade losses, so basically the misallocation that happens because of the imposition of the, of the tariff. So what I, something that is uh, important to notice here is that the, that the capital contribution becomes more and more negative over time, and the, and the reason for that is just simply that, you know, even if you completely stop investing on this, on this period, you know, the capital stock doesn't fall completely, it doesn't depreciate fully within, within period, so the capital contribution is becoming uh, more and, and, and more negative over, over time. On the other hand, the, the trade losses or the misallocation losses because of the, because of the iceberg cost are actually becoming less stringent over, over time, and the reason for that is simply that the trade elasticities are becoming, are becoming uh, more, more important. Okay. So uh, these are the these are the, the trade flows that I don't have uh, time to talk uh, to talk uh, about them. But something that it might be interested in is that if you think of this is the trade flows by type of uh, goods, that something that is important is that the trade in investment goods from the opposite blocks fall sharply in the in the first period. Again, because even if the trade elasticities uh, are, are still very stringent and you cannot uh, substitute one one supplier by another, the durable nature of capital allows you to have some intertemporal, intertemporal substitution. Uh, I don't have to talk about anticipation, but let me just uh, talk, about, uh, talk about this, uh, this comparison. So how does these estimates or how does the, the estimates or how do the estimates on, on this uh, model compare to other ways of modeling thread fragmentation? So what I'm going to do here is to run a comparison with two cases. The first one is uh, the, one, the, the one in red, in which there are no capital dynamics, or if you want to think, there are full depreciation within period. And on top of that, I don't take into account the, the changes in the, impress, in, the, in the investment bundle. So what you see, the blue line that I have been showing you over the, over the, over the presentation, over in the, in the short run, this method of accounting could be overestimating the, overestimating the effect. And it would be overestimating for the reason that it's assuming a full depreciation, so a full adjustment on, on capital on the very first period, and this might, not be, this might not be true. On the other hand, on the long term, if you don't take into account the, the, the changes in the, in the prices of, of capital goods, you could be underestimating the negative effect on the long term. Because, as I said before, the fact that also the capital goods are going to be exposed to higher trading costs it's going to decrease the stock of capital on the on the long term. If you don't take into account that that, eff that effect, you could be underestimating the the total the total effect. So uh, just to just to just to finish as the as the main uh, takeaway takeaway the message is that the, there might be moderate long run uh, effect on on Western economies uh, 1.6 1.7 on the on the GNE over a time year horizon. However, something that is going to be key are going to be the, the short run effects. Depending on, on whether the firms or the countries can anticipate or not, I couldn't talk about it today, but if they could anticipate, the effect is going to be much smoother. First of all, because the trade fragmentation would happen under higher trade elasticities, and on top of that, because it would give time to, to, to accommodate the capital, uh, the, capital, the capital stock, so it would allow not a um, uh, sharp and, and recovery, but instead of a convergence from, from above. For the rest of the world, the Eastern Bloc would be the one uh, facing the, the most severe cases. And the neutral countries, they again, they will be benefiting from some uh, rerouting of trade, but these gains are not going to be very large because the world GDP overall will be, will be shrinking. Thank you. Let's hurry uh, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, Baptiste. Um, Meunier will be in the discussion from our international department, appropriately. Exactly. Thanks for having me there, although it was a relatively short trip. Um, but so I really like this paper. We're using it in a joint, uh, in a joint report, as also Javier alluded to. But it's a really nice paper. It's a really nice contribution to the literature. So just in a nutshell, what it does so the approach is it develop a multi-country, multi-sector model with production and what's new investment network. And then it simulates some trade fragmentation scenario along geopolitical line, which you have in the literature. And then the result, if we move to the right of the slides, and um, 
differently to other multi-country, multi-sector model, it's able to get some dynamic effect of trade fragmentation, showing that the losses in GDP and g &E would be higher in the short run due to the inflexibility of supply chain in the short run, which is also something you kind of find in the literature, but not in this type of dynamic way, which makes this paper really nice. Then the second key finding is that it shows that there is actually a high impact of capital accumulation. But if you look at the long run impact, almost half of it are coming from capital accumulation. This is also very different to what we have in, in general multi-country, multi-sector models. So this is also another nice contribution. And then something that was in the paper, but that was not so much shown today, is that since you have dynamic effects, uh, actually you can get some sense of inflation dynamics in this model which is actually very important and how we use it in the report that we have in common with Javier. So just to tell you a bit why it's a very nice thing from a modeling perspective. So if I'm relatively simplistic there, in trade modeling, you generally have the choice between two types of models, which are there in the light blue box. So you generally have either DSG model, which you have there on the left, where you have dynamic effect, but then you've got a very limited granularity in terms of country and sector. And then on the right, you have also multi-country, multi-sector model, uh, which only give you static effects. So you jump from one general equilibrium to another general equilibrium, but you have very detailed global sectoral linkages. And this paper, which is there in the dark blue box, is very nice because it's trying to bridge a gap a bit between the two by having dynamic effects still in, in some very rich global sectoral linkages. Now there are other papers doing that in the literature. So you have there, uh, some reference on the left of the slide, but most of those papers actually focus more on shock propagation and trying to get to be the source of the different propagation in volatility, while this paper is more about scenario analysis. So that's, it. that's what makes it a bit stand out in this literature. And so it's a really nice modeling contribution. It has also a very high policy relevance. I mean, we're using it in this joint report to have a bit the effect of, of trade fragmentation and inflation. And there are tons of implications also more globally about the impact of production network on inflation and how this could change the dynamics of inflation, which, I mean, for an institution like ours and like Banco de España, can have tons of potential and tons of implication. Now it's still pretty much in the drafting stage. I think I, I saw a, a previous paper, a previous paper that was not really presented today, and there are still some uh, comments to be made. But just to start off, so with a very nice contribution is this capital accumulation channel. So I think a key result from your paper is described by the figure on the left, where basically you decompose real GDP losses between what would come from a general multi-country, multi-sector model, so without capital accumulation in blue there, and what's coming from capital accumulation. And basically what it means there is that if you ignore this capital accumulation channels, then you might be underestimating real GDP losses of trade fragmentation by around half. And I think it complements nicely this whole literature on the importance of global capital linkages, like this Forster et al. paper, which does it a bit in an open economy, and this Ravi Kumar paper, which does this more in, the, in an open economy framework. Um, and then this paper, but this paper, if you focus only on capital accumulation channel, it's actually very close to the Fernandez paper in 2017, which was published in the Journal of Monetary Economics. So that's why also in the paper you develop also all these dynamic aspects on which I have a bit more reservation. So the first, just to illustrate a bit the reservation that I had about the dynamics, this is taken from the version of the paper I had. So on the left, for example, you see real GDP and real g &E in light blue in the neutral block. And then you see it has a bit some bumpy uh, dynamics. So it goes up, goes down, up, down. And then you're not very sure whether there is a true convergence after, after 20 years. And then also for inflation effect, what you see there, so that would be the, the, the chart on the right, what you see is that if you don't have um, Wendig dexation, which is the dark blue line, then the effect pretty much dies out after one year. So you've got an inflationary impact um, basically at period one, and then afterward, there, there's no inflation. So you need this wedge indexation to get some effect, but that still dies out relatively uh, quickly. So it leads us a bit to, to question a bit how you, um, how you pin those, this nominal impact uh, based on your model. So what you do, you have your dynamic models, you get some nominal impact, which are based on investment decision over time. And there are two 
two groups of command there. The first group is you might miss things that would allow you to describe properly all those inflation dynamics. So you've got them on the left. So the first command is you might miss a central bank block, which would actually react to higher inflation and cut interest rate. And then not only affect inflation, but might also affect investment, you know, through, for example, the interest rates, so it doesn't seem to be a variable in your model, but at least by decreasing uh, the aggregate demand. You might need also some price stickiness, so just to stagger a bit over time, some menu cost a bit to stagger over time, the price increases. Because there, what you've got in your model is basically you've got the general equilibrium in prices almost in period one. This is why in the blue curve that I showed in the previous slide, basically you've got this impact on uh, on period one and then it dies out and then you've got nothing so introducing some mechanism like this might allow to have more persistence and maybe more credible nominal side variable and then the second group of command on the right is that in multi-country multi-sector model you generally pin relative prices only so they're only in relative terms so in the paper at least the version i had was not very explicit on the assumption that you would need to get uh, CPI, uh, CPI inflation. So you kind of did that in the presentation when you said this is because of wedges and this is how you, you pinned on all those prices. But it might be clearer in the model. Um, just to say also now what I've done is to compare a bit those effects that you got on inflation. So this would be on the left. So your effect without indexation, which is this yellow line there, which goes up in period one and then dies out. And then with indexation, which is this blue curve, with uh, a DSG model which is calibrated with exactly the same shock, so uh, this Cold War shock, and the same trade linkages, so based on the same IO matrix. And this is the blue uh, dots there, which are quarterly. And what you see is that indeed you've got much more inflation persistence in this DSG model, which your model doesn't really, uh, is not really able to, to feature. What could be nice also is to look at Ravi Kumar uh, et al. paper in 2019 because they have pretty much a similar uh, similar focus on having um, this trade model with capital accumulation and then see all the dynamics. So then just to, to recap on this, so you have a bit of dual focus, at least in the paper, uh, which is you focus a bit on capital accumulation and then you're trying to get from this capital accumulation all the dynamic multi-country, multi-sector model. I think the contribution on capital accumulation is nice and clear. It complements the literature, so it's relatively similar to this Fernandez paper. Now, I have a bit some concern about dynamic effect, and in particular on the nominal side. So my suggestion there would be, either you focus the paper rather on capital accumulation effects, which is what you did pretty much in the presentation. Uh, but I think having this dynamic effect on inflation could be really an important contribution to the literature and or, and for us as an institution, a really important policy contribution. So I would also encourage you to maybe rework a bit those inflation dynamics, see what you can do um, in this model to have Calvo pricing, to have uh, some monetary policy authority to get some more plausible dynamic nominal effects. So this was my main comment. I have another uh, set of comments on scenario calibration, so I can go quickly so we can go, uh, we can go to dinner. But the thing is, you have different trade elasticity. So you essentially have, you take bore metal for short run and then you take uh, Fontaine et al for long run. I think in bore metal, you have both short run and long run elasticity, which are also detailed by sector. So maybe for consistency, you could just take bore metal and then go on with this long run and short run. Also because long run estimate in bore metal and Fontaine are very different. Um, then the second in the middle is, you have time varying trade elasticities, but you don't vary the other elasticity. And there's not really some economic rationale for this. Now there's a practical rationale, which is in multi-country, multi-sector model, actually production elasticity do not matter much. This, is, this has been shown in the back uh, et al. paper, and this is also what we, what we have empirically. Uh, but still, I mean, maybe for the beauty of it, you can have uh, some time variation in production elasticity. Yeah. And then, you know, see what happens. Of course, it might, might not have an effect, but at least you, you might want to try it as a robustness check. And just my last comment uh, to keep good relation with Philippe is that um, what you have is a multi-country, multi-sector model with a lot of countries, a lot of sectors, but then you are doing a across the board trade shock on all sectors along only three blocks. So you can have pretty much the same effect if you take a three block, one sector model. Um, and so I would suggest that you have some scenario where you make a bit more use of this multi-country, multi-sector dimension 
In particular, you could exploit the energy dimension because you have this CLEMS framework which singles out all this energy contribution where you could try to have something. An example of Russian gas would be really relevant there. And now I have some other comments, but um, to keep Philippe happy, I will not go through them and I will send you the slides so we can discuss. <laughs> 